In this video, we will hear the reaction from Layman Frank, who's going to talk about some of the content he has listened to in the videos on the Path of Zen. I was just listening to one of your talks on uh, the state of Western Buddhism. I'm just uh, sending a voice clip because I'm, I'm driving and I can't really type. <clears throat> But I had thought this before, and I may have even brought this up to you a time or two. I've even, I think, brought it up to Ponyo and some others. But, you know, today, people in the West seem to think that for them to be Buddhists, they have to go to one of these Asian countries. They need to, in their renunciation, they need to go off to Thailand or Sri Lanka or find some Japanese person or some somebody of that nature and this isn't to uh, call those people out in fact I'm actually very much appreciative of the the those people for being good custodians of the Dhamma but as you have pointed out and it's this is like this goes without saying because when we're talking of the, the Buddha Dhamma, we're talking about it's truly transcendent. It's super mundane. But whenever even those who bring, who are able to distill out these teachings, they still have to teach through the prism of their own aggregates. And with that, as any light passing through a prism, it brings through a particular shading that is in alignment with those aggregates which have been conditioned over time. So with that brings that residue, as some would call it, with the teaching. And it's very good for those um, able to see not to get enamored or caught up in the residue and actually being able to distinguish residues from the um, the really heartwood as the Buddha would say of the teaching which I think you do a, a wonderful job at uh, expressing at least I can pick up on it um, but I've always thought you know to get on to my point with Western Buddhism as I've thought this myself you know I'm a householder I, I, I make no bones about it I, I I'm not sitting the fence, but there is a part of me that longs to renounce. And I've read many of the sutta and the old uh, stories of how the Buddha was prior to even getting that designation. And just also just the, the way people were back then and who came to the Sangha and how it was formed. You know, before all the Vinaya and the 227 rules of the Theravadins and everything, they didn't have all of that initially. And, and even the Buddha himself, if we were truly, as Westerners, if we are truly sincere and honest about our practice, then we too would be ready to just go off into the wilderness as he did. Who did he take refuge in? He went to various teachers, which I think we all have to certain extents. Whether those teachers be, um, you know, they, they, teachers can take many forms. Even if someone doesn't have like a more um, conventional teacher, like sitting with day in and day out lessons and whatnot, people will go to sources as their teacher, whether they be texts, whether they be videos. There's all types of different sources. And uh, then people have different levels of practice. I think, every, you know, ideally you would want a teacher who is penetrated, but we know how hard that is, especially when you're a person from the world, an ignorant person, which we all are starting out more ignorant. Um, some people have an innate wisdom to them and are better suited it's a, it's a karmic thing but but everybody starting out is more ignorant than where they finish and some people might even end up being more ignorant even <laughs> after the fact depending on who they go to for a teacher 
But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I think if we were, were to really get into the spirit of the Buddha's the Buddha, it is to renounce and to be honest and mindful and alert and aware and that to understand that this path is communicative in what we learn. And we have ultimately, as they say in Pali, Atahi Atano Natho, which means, you know, ultimately you have to take yourself as a refuge. Right? So there is that, and I and I that is actually one of the Pali sayings, Atahi Atano Natho. And um Obviously, we go to the Dhamma, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, the Triple Gem Refuge. But even then, you have to depend on yourself to some extent in finding the most suitable teachers and sources. And then, ultimately, even the good teachers can't do it for you. So, in a way, that Atahi Atanonatho of taking oneself as one's refuge, there is some truth to that. And um, I think what a lot of people do, especially if we get into uh, some of these, we get too much into the residues of the East, is they end up taking, um, by extension, some uh, refuge in the residue. And that's a mistake. You know, even, you know, one of my favorite monks, Theravadan monks, was Ajahn Mun. I've read his biography. I've, I used to read everything I could about him. I thought he was fascinating in my early days. And to this day, I have a lot of respect. But, you know, he took um, the Dhamma ultimately as his refuge. Um, he did not... Oh, he said... He abides by the customs of the noble ones. Now that was that's interesting. So he follows the customs of the noble ones, not the customs of any particular people or residue. This was him saying directly what needed to be said, similar to our Buddha when he returned home after having sat under that Dhamma tree and coming to realization. His father was not very happy with him when he returned because he was going on alms round. He was a beggar. And this was not becoming of a prince who was royal blood, right? Prince Siddhartha. And uh, his dad was mad and he had to tell his dad. He's like, I no longer follow the, the cost, customs of the Sakyans. I'm, I follow the customs of the noble ones. So we have to be very clear about this, even in the West. And I think... The, the best teachers are, they make no bones about it, and they're able to distill out the real, the real essence and at least show people in a way to penetrate to that understanding to not get too caught up in that residue. One thing I hear a lot, and I read through one of the comments on your message, was people who get really caught up in the idea of compassion and altruism I think initially a lot of people are drawn to the Dhamma because they they are told that ultimately that's what it's about I remember there's a beat there's a talk by uh, uh, Bhikkhu uh, or Ajahn Jeff and uh, it was he he had someone who came to him and she said to him, she said, you know what I really love about Buddhism? And he said, oh, yeah. He's like, what's that? And she says, because it's all about love. And he stopped her immediately. He goes, no, it's not. It's not. It's not all about love. It's about liberation. And he had to really, it shocked her when he said that. But what people don't understand, it's not that we say love is bad. Obviously, we prefer love to hate. I think it's better. But people don't quite see the, the relation between love and hate. What do, they say about, what do they say about love being the far enemy? Do you not understand that? Have you ever heard that? Um, 
the near enemy is hatred, obviously. The far, the far enemy, or was it, or is it the, it might be the other way around, I'm not sure. But what they're getting at is, it's, a lot of times it's, it's, it's based on some attachment and affinity, an affinity and an attachment, which is also based upon ignorance. And I think the Buddha most certainly had compassion, but they don't, but do people understand, like if you read about the Buddha and study the Buddha, the, the Buddha, he was compassionate in that he saw the fruitlessness of the conditioned world. So all of these things that people suffer over, the bulk of the things people suffer over, even the stuff like you and I may suffer over to extents, they're, they're conditioned and, they're, and, and we, you and I are always honest about it. I mean, obviously we sometimes diverge into different talks on, on worldly matters, but I don't think we're disillusioned to that far into, like if, you really, if we really break things down, we know that they're fruitless and the buddha would be he he being the master the great the 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 teacher he would always reframe your thinking and he would have you focus on what was most important that's what the whole idea of the handful of leaves it's not that the buddha didn't know a lot of things he kept his teaching focused so the utmost compassion is to get one to penetrate and see those four noble truths and take follow that eightfold path more or less that's the compassion when we talk when we hear when i see people talk about like oh yeah you should be more compassionate towards these people who are suffering what the hell do they think you're doing yeah and really if they would listen you are being compassionate because you're teaching them about the nature or you're trying at least doing a lot more than a lot of people you're trying to get people to see the nature of their suffering it's just odd to me it's crazy to me but i mean i think i i'm following you pretty well um but it's just something it's just like i know you and i have had talks before like there's a lot of there's mistranslations like another big one a lot of people want to talk about meta they think meta is so great and it is i'm not saying it's not but they always say, oh, it's loving kindness. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of a rough translation from how I've come to understand it. And then you get people who are more, they, they have more tethers to the heartstrings and they think that that's about like a worldly level of altruism and compassion. Like for instance, let's talk about compassion for a minute. Consider you see a poor defenseless worm struggling on the pavement after a rain and then you see a robin come down about ready to, to just eat it whole having compassion for the worm you quickly you throw a rock at that robin to save that poor worm's life you're so compassionate for that lowly downtrodden worm you may even injure the robin in throwing the rock at it so you're being compassionate for the worm at the expense of the bird. And because it's within the bird's nature to eat worms. That's what they subsist off of. As miserable of a life as it is to us, that's how they live. So your compassion is a great harm to the bird. And if we were to really investigate that little case study right there, we would see the same damn thing happens in the human sphere. Let's just take politics, for example. Say you have two parties, which we know very well, Democrats and Republicans. Well, we'll be compassionate for those poor Democrats and those who support the Democrats by giving them X, Y, Z, but that will be always in spite of what the other wants. Both of them have different natures within their aggregates that make them feel a certain way about a particular issue. But we're being compassionate and each side thinks that they're more compassionate and this is the issue with trying to take up altruistic ends in a human sphere and it's all tiresome being honest with you and you know me well enough and i've never 
been dishonest, especially with my spiritual friends, about what I'm about and what's within my own personal makeup of the aggregates, which I sh I have to deal with, regardless of whether or not I'm aware of the aggregates and what in 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 big parts of the aggregates. I know that I would tend, for whatever reason, to lean somewhat towards the right. And I'm at a point now where I can step outside of that and view that, view the viewing process and that. But the, but the thing is, the view that I have is upon that heap of aggregates. So when I'm working from the world and, and if I work from an ignorant standpoint, then I'm going to be from that position. So people don't understand, they think all people are the same, but really people have all a vast array of different natures that they've been carrying with them from for aeons and lifetimes, that they're continually, continually changing and in, in, in flux. And uh, it's just kind of interesting to me, like these, I don't pe think people quite understand, like the Buddha Dhamma is a contemplative, Dhamma. I think that's another thing. Like you have to really contemplate on oneself and what one's about. And I think a good place to do your work is it's to go inside and to understand one's own aggregates, but ultimately to understand the nature of knowing the viewing process that which I think you have alluded to into your in your videos. But I don't know, I saw one person make some comment towards you that I, I guess they didn't approve of something you said. It seemed too harsh to them. Uh, yeah, it's going to get it's going to be a little bit harsh, uh, especially if you're caught up in the world. And, and we think it's clear it's, there, it's clear that a lot of people are still are still there. And um, but that's just the nature of the world, too. You know what I mean? Like we're always going to have these competing factions and we're going to have the different natures of different beings and they may be at odds sometimes only so much you can do with it if you wish to leave an audio reaction to any of the videos that i have made please send them to me on my telegram account that you're seeing on the screen and in the description